Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study on the life of David, where we will be in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10. Now, before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we're right with the Lord by confessing our known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and all that you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, Samuel was with Jesse in search of the son of Jesse to be anointed as king. We're going to look at the last couple of verses one more time. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Is that all the young men? He, that is Jesse, replied, There is still the youngest one. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. Send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. Now, I put that phrase, our attention to other things, uh, that's implied. That means it's, it's what we're supposed to understand in the text, though it's not in the printed word. It's just implied. Well, David is the youngest and perhaps even the smallest, but by no means is he an ignorant or unaware young man. He's not naive. We will see something of this of his character in today's lesson. So, we have David as a shepherd keeping the sheep. And as you remember, it's a common biblical image of a leader or king to be called a shepherd over his subjects or sheep. And we began to look at the shepherd sheep metaphor, that is a figure of speech, a way people say things to compare something with something else. Now this would pass on to David over time. Listen to 2 Samuel 7, 8. Now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. So here we see a parallel between the shepherd and the ruler and the flock and the people Israel. And then those two great verses in John, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now there's more references in scripture to this. And one reason I want to go over this to make you see how many times it's used and how common it is. Jesus used the terms and when the apostles wrote about Jesus, they used the terms also. Listen to this. Jesus is the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20. He is the shepherd, 1 Peter 2, 25. He is the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5, 4. So again, sheep, shepherd, king, or ruler, and people are a common metaphor. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Peter about love? And Peter kept asking, or Jesus, excuse me, kept asking Peter, do you love me? And Jesus respond, yes, Lord. And he'd say, well, then feed my lambs. Ask him a similar question, then tend my sheep. Understand this metaphor. If a shepherd is to feed the lambs and he's to tend the sheep, and we know other things that shepherds do, they protect them, they lead them. 
that tells us a couple of things. Of course, we have the idea that a pastor of a church is a shepherd. He shepherds the flock. But we also know the Lord Jesus Christ is our great shepherd. So we need to understand this metaphor, and I think we've done enough now that we should understand it. Let's go back to our verse 11, where we're looking for the next son to be king. I'll put it up on the board. So Samuel says to him, this is the last half of the verse, send and get him for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. In other words, we can't leave until we see him. All right, can't leave. First things first, this has to be done before they can continue on other things. Well, Jesse sends for him, verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. The idea of ruddy here means reddish appearance. Perhaps he's been out in the sun a lot, but often it also indicates he's healthy looking. He's a handsome young man, uh, attractive eyes. Apparently he had eyes that were uh, a little rare, but beautiful to look at. And then the Lord gives the, gives the order, arise, anoint him, for this is he. So the Lord confirms to Samuel through inner revelation that this is the one to be anointed as king. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Well, this says three important things pretty quickly. Let's break them down. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. The horn was a symbol of strength probably a horn of, a, of, a, of a, some sort of animal, of course. And it had uh, olive oil in it. Well, usually it's olive oil. And oil is symbolic of the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we see that in other passages. But oil symbolized the Spirit coming upon him. So the anointing with oil symbolized being anointed with the Holy Spirit. So God has the Holy Spirit come upon David. The Holy Spirit would give David the ability to rule as God wanted. It gave him the enablement is what I usually use the term, how I use it. Um, and this enablement would give him God's strength to help him make the right decisions for the nation as a shepherd, his shepherd for his people. You see? So the next thing we see and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Well, uh, this is what I just referred to, but I want you to see something else here. It came upon him mightily, real powerful. Boom, it was there. And he, he sensed it strongly. Something had happened. And then notice the last phrase, from that day forward. He's one king who would not lose the Spirit. Now, we'll look at um, some others who seem to have lost it. Uh, certainly, we get indicators that Saul had lost it. The Lord, le the Lord leaves him on his own. That's what happens. Finally, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, nearby town. And notice one more thing. I should have left it up there. The first sentence again, in the presence of his brothers. His brothers were able to witness this. This is a good thing. Their youngest brother was getting anointed, and he would be the next king. That's something they need to recognize, it, recognize, and they got to see it firsthand. They knew David, of course, their brother, and they saw this happen to him, and they can confirm it in their own words that David is the king. We're not going to give him a problem, even though we're older, and we may even think we're smarter. No, they didn't say that. But they are to understand that their youngest brother, David, is king. Now, we looked at some of the other brothers and their names. Let's look at the word David for a moment. 
It's actually pronounced a David or David, okay? David. Probably from a word that means beloved or love. We can't be 100% sure, but it's very close to that. Loved one. All right? And we, of course, ourselves understand what that means, to be loved. Be loved by others, to be loved by God, and so on. This will be true of David. And by the way, this is the first time David's name appears in the book of Samuel. Now, one other thing, when I mentioned that the Spirit would not leave him, that's something we need to remember. The Holy Spirit would stay upon him. David would never get so far out of line that he lost the Spirit, though he did get out of line a few times, but not so long and so badly that the Lord took the Spirit away and said, you're not going to be functioning as king anymore. Let's look at our map for a moment. I want to show you a couple of places. Okay, so this is going on down in Bethlehem. All right. Uh, we saw Samuel left, went to Ramah up here. Well, let's continue. Next, we're going to see David enter Saul's service. David enters Saul's service. In verse 14, I've just mentioned this. The Spirit leaves Saul. Verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now, the Spirit of the Lord, or the Holy Spirit, his ministry upon the kings of Israel, as we can see here, was not permanent. He could come and go. He could depart from a person who is enabling, and he did that with Saul. So Saul would no longer have the Holy Spirit giving him the power and the strength to rule as he should. He seems to be ignoring it anyway, that the Spirit prompts him to do something, he doesn't do it. He knows he's supposed to do it. He still doesn't do it. When he doesn't do the right thing and he's convicted that's the wrong thing to do, he learns to ignore it. Now twice we see the Spirit uh, come upon Saul in his story, 1 Samuel 10.10, 10, uh, 11.6, and now we see it leave. So it's been going back and forth, but not very many times from what we can tell, probably just two or three at most. But we just saw the Spirit come upon David in the previous verse. Now we see it leave Saul. Now this makes me want to think, and I'm not the only one that's thought this, when the Spirit left Saul, he went right over to David. Now it's not quite in the order we would want it. We'd want the Spirit leaving Saul first, but that's not the way it seems to have happened. So almost the same time, we see the verses next to each other. This probably happened about the same time that the Spirit left Saul when David was anointed and received the Spirit. So Saul lost the one who gave him power, that would be the Holy Spirit, and Saul also lost his advisor, Samuel. He doesn't have someone to tell him God's word, and he's also lost the Spirit. Now, there's other people who had received the Spirit over time. Uh, Samson in Judges 14, 6, 19, chapter, um, excuse me, 14, 6, and 19, and also 15, 14. Now, could David lose the Spirit? Yes, he could have, but he didn't. He stayed within the realm of obedience enough to not lose the Spirit. In Psalm 51, we haven't studied that yet in our Psalm series. It's one of the next ones we're going to study when we get back into uh, the Psalm study by itself. But David did mention in Psalm 51 the possibility of the Spirit departing from him. That's Psalm 51. So, Let's understand the simple principle. Here you have the person, in this case the king, 
let's just write here king God would send his spirit to enable the king sometime, and sometime he'd call it back, so to speak. All right, that's sort of the picture we get in our mind. Now today, we as Christians, let's just write a Christian here, okay? Let's just say you. As a Christian, you received, notice I put the arrow inside, the indwelling in other words, he dwells in you. Holy Spirit. HS means Holy Spirit. And he's always within you. However, for him to empower us and for him to live the way we would want him to, we have to let him. This is what Saul wasn't doing. So he eventually lost it. So we have to allow the Spirit to control us, and we do that by giving ourselves over to Him. Mentally, it's like we're saying in our heads, God, control me. Holy Spirit, use me, direct me. And you make that decision. Now, there are times in your life when you have temptation to sin. If you're tempted whether you might do that sin or not, the Holy Spirit's saying, don't do it. And you know you're not supposed to do it. And now you say, well, I'm just going to do it. And then the Spirit says, don't do it. So you get this loud voice, kind of. Not a real voice, but you know what I mean. You sense it. This is not right. And so you do it anyway. Well, you just quit listening to the Spirit. And you lose his control because you're refusing his control. So how do you get back? Make sure you confess your sin of disobedience, whatever that was, and then open yourself back up to the Spirit's control. It's that simple. It's supposed to be simple. It's a grace provision for every believer. And you have that. Now, something else happens to Saul that's rather strange. It's not very good for him. Um, as we will see next, we were looking at verse 14. Now, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Let's talk about the evil spirit. The evil spirit is a word, it's called evil, the word. I'm just going to show it to you in the Hebrew. It's a very simple word. It looks kind of like an R, but it's not. But it has that sound, by the way. But in Hebrew, we read from right to left. Okay, this is the, well, that's not a very good one. Let me try that again. That's a bad R. It's more just like this. Okay, this is the vowel like an A, and this is silent. So it's pronounced Ra. Okay, R, A, R sound, A sound, silent, Ra. It has a range of meanings. It can mean evil, bad, harmful, misery. Now listen, let me put this on the board for you. It'll be easier that way, as I'll explain it as we go through it. So, he can be evil, wicked, harmful, bad. He can be a bad person. You can be in a raw mood. That means you're miserable, okay? Or he's a raw person. He's evil. Or he did something really raw. That means he did something bad, you see? It's in that range of... Not good, all right? Now let's talk about the word spirit. Now this word spirit's interesting because people wonder, did the Lord really send an evil spirit on Saul? And some people say, no, he was just a, a harmful spirit. Or he was just a spirit that was going to give him trouble. Well, it could very well be translated evil spirit. And that's the way I translate it. Now let me explain. This is a little long. So 
Listen up. Here's the word for spirit. I'm going to put all this up here and go through it with you. This is a little deeper than usual, but we're going to try it. The word for spirit is ruach. See the R again? Ruach. It means breath, wind, or spirit. Just think of it, blowing. Okay? Animals have spirit. They have breath, right? Man or animals. You need that for life. We also have within us a human spirit. Now, this isn't just a breath. This is a, uh, and uh, what, should I, what should I call it? It's something that God puts in you that is alive. It's who you are on the inside. It's the inner person. And when you, can, when you put that with a body, it's what makes a person a person. So, it was just a body laying there like you had with Adam, the first, first man, just a body laying there, just a body. He's not alive. He's not even a person. He's just a body. But when God breathed into him and gave him breath, he at the same time gave him his spirit, and he became alive. He became a person. The Bible also describes when you lose the spirit, you're dead. You're just a body again. And that's what happens when people die. Their spirit leaves them. Their human spirit leaves them. At the same time, their breath leaves them, right? Well, so those are two meanings of the word ruach. It can also mean disposition. Now, disposition is kind of like, well, you have an attitude. You have a good attitude, a bad attitude. And that can be discouraged, despondent. You, you're not responding to anybody. That's what that means. You can be happy. Or you have a poor spirit. That means you're lowly. Sometimes it means humble. It can be courageous, angry, troubled, or crushed. That's just some of the ways that the spirit can be, the conditions. So, that's just describing the different ways in which a spirit can be within a person. Uh, now, what I mean by that is, this isn't the human spirit when I say disposition. It's your mood. So now we have three definitions of spirit. The breath, all right, the wind, that type of thing. The human spirit, the inner person, the Disposition, the type of attitude a person has. So a person can be, oh, he has a very low spirit today. His spirits are not up, right? Don't we use it that way? Then we have it used as a spiritual being, an actual being. An angel is a spirit. God the Father is a spirit. In fact, it says that Scripture says God is spirit. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, isn't Jesus God? Yes, the second person of the Trinity is both God and man, but he's also spirit. You, If you were lived back during the days of Jesus, you could see Jesus as a man, but you couldn't see him as the spirit God because the spirit is not visible. But what we're saying here is a spirit is another definition of the word ruach. It can be a spiritual being, like an angel or a fallen angel, which we call a demon. Now, a demon can have a body or not, depending on whether he takes on a body. Now, I should also say an angel or demon can have a body. But what I mean by that is they can possess or be given a human body to be used. We see this in the Old Testament. We also see demons taking human bodies to possess them in the New Testament. So here we're seeing the fourth definition of spirit is it's a spiritual being. And then the one we've had in our passage, the Holy Spirit, the fifth definition. He's the third person of the Trinity. Now, the question is, which kind of spirit do we have here? Is it a mood? Is it a demon? 
For is it even a good spirit that's sent there to act and do harm on him? Well, those are three possibilities. But I want you to see what he does before we determine exactly what it is. Notice the last, last couple of words. It torments him. It torments him. This word means to terrify, to overwhelm with fear. Now, some think that God would not send an evil demonic spirit. However, they might think that uh, it's a good spirit that's sent to give him a hard time. I don't think it's a good spirit. It just seems to seem to fit what we usually see described as an angel. I think it's actually an evil spirit. God allows an evil spirit, a demon, to come and torment him. After all, the spirit of the Lord has left him. The Lord's not working with him. He's having to deal with the world and the devil on his own. And the Lord's allowing a spirit to come in. Now, the Lord wouldn't let this spirit do too much because he's still king. But he would keep him within his limits. But in the meantime, he allowed it to torment Saul. And the other thing I want you to see, and an evil spirit from the Lord. It's sent from the Lord. So the Lord has it, has it come down there. So I take this as a real, a real demonic spirit that was allowed to torment him, to terrify him. Now, during the days of Jesus, we know that evil spirits would enter people and he would cast them out. If you know that some of the stories that make them act crazy, they'd live in tombs or cut themselves or they'd get on the ground and roll over and shake and do all sorts of crazy things, okay? One man got super strength and broke his chains. It didn't help. He was so strong. And this is demon possession. Now, we're not talking about demon possession. We're talking about a demon influence so strong that it made Saul's life miserable, scary. He seems to be terrified at times. So understand that demons can torment people. It happened with Saul. It happened with Paul. Paul, yes, the apostle Paul. Listen to this one. It even describes it. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Then it goes on, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Notice, torment so what happens here is, the long story, Paul gets a trip to heaven, and he has revelations. God reveals to him a lot of things, things he's not supposed to talk about. And that's what it means when it says it's surpassingly great revelations. So to keep him in line, that he won't get proud and start maybe thinking he's better than everybody else, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a real pain, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So this would be a reminder that God is uh, does not want you to get out of line, to get proud of what you saw. Well, let's go back to our story. So Saul has an evil spirit tormenting him, and his servants realize that. Listen to what they say in verse 15. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. So there's a supernatural evil being causing Saul fear, to be afraid. Now remember, Saul is a man who God had chose as king to give the people what they wanted. They wanted a king. They liked him. This is who they got. He had the highest office in the land. He even got to exercise a prophetic gift. But then when he got disobedient, he departed from God's will. 
he not only lost his position of kingship, but he also lost the spirit that enabled him to rule right. Now it's like he's losing his mind. So it goes from bad to bad to worse. How should I say that? It goes from bad to worse to more worse. How's that? This is divine discipline at best and divine punishment at worst. So his life is getting miserable. Well, we've looked at the spirit going back and forth. Now let's look some more because who else went, well, back and forth? Samuel. Let's chart this out a little bit. We have Saul. And David. All right. We have Samuel. Let's write Samuel up here. He was the prophet that would be sent to, uh, remember he originally was a judge also. He is a prophet. He acted as high priest. He had some pretty high offices, the highest in the land. So, he worked with Saul, right? But then when Saul becomes disobedient, I'm just going to write down the word disobedient, okay? Samuel left Saul. So he leaves Saul. He will move over to David and anoint him right? So he moves over to David. Samuel leaves Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 35. Samuel moves, moves to David to anoint him as king in 1 Samuel 16, 4. We also see that the spirit, let's see, what should we do? Let's put that as blue. The spirit left Saul and went over to David. The Spirit rushes upon David, 1 Samuel 16, 13. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, 1 Samuel 16, 14. And then Saul, Samuel gets something in addition. He gets an evil spirit. So he's really lost out. He's lost Samuel as an advisor, the one who used to tell him what God wanted, and he's lost the spirit to enable him to be king. Now he gets an evil spirit. And what's going to happen? Now listen to this. This is interesting. God is going to bring David into Saul's life. And here he sits. The next king is going to come into Saul's life. He also has the spirit. So Saul has now lost both Samuel and the spirit. And he attempts to try to get back right, but it's really too late. Um, the Lord was finished with Saul. Now he's in a bad way. Now he has an evil spirit. He's lost the Holy Spirit. And he's tormented by an evil spirit. Well, listen to what happens next. Saul's servants wanted to help Saul. So they're talking here, and they say, Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to search for a man who knows how to play the lyre. That's a musical instrument. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play with his hand and you will be well. So he will play the lyre with his hand. So he becomes, in fact, they have those today, a musical therapist. You know, sometimes people use music to calm them down. Well, they're going to bring in somebody who can play an instrument to calm him down. So they knew that music could affect the spirit. And we know that too. Spirits 
excuse me, our spirit can be lifted up with certain types of music. It might be uh, birthday music. Uh, we have a birthday at our house today. We're going to celebrate one of my daughters. And then uh, uh, it can be uh, spiritual music, type we use in singing hymns and that type of thing. Patriotic music appeals to your patriotism. Then you're going to have very sad music or blues or something like that. It puts you, you know, you kind of stand a feel sorry for yourself mood, which isn't a very good thing. But they thought music would help Saul get better. So they start sending out for somebody who can come in and play music. And of course, who's able to do that? David. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Verse 18, one of the young men, this would be one of the servants, answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, <laughs> I didn't say that right, Bethlehemite, who knows how to play the lyre, a strong man of courage, and a man of war, put it in speech, he's careful with what he says, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Now this says a lot about David, and it's all true. First, they say he's strong. Uh, he's a strong man of courage. That means he's mighty, courageous. Uh, some would say he's a man of valor. He's also a man of war. If he needs to go to war, he can go. He can fight. He's a warrior. Maybe his reputation of the bear and the, uh, the lion had gotten around. You know, he did have brothers that talked. But uh, we don't know for sure, but apparently this young man knew David. He's put it in speech. He's very careful in what he talks, so he won't embarrass you, king. Um, he has a good presence. That means he appears well. Uh, he doesn't uh, slump around, you know, good poise, that type of thing. And at the end it says, and the Lord is with him. That's the best qualification of all. And, of course, Saul could, lose, could use that now, couldn't he, after what he's lost? So David is not some wimpy little skinny guy that's a nerd in music. He's a skilled musician with a lyre, a stringed instrument. He's courageous, a man of war. He's a fighter if need be. He will knock back down when there needs to be a physical confrontation. In other words, he'll defend what he's supposed to defend. Even he has to pull out a weapon. He knows how to conduct himself around people. How to speak properly. Knows when to speak and not to. What to say. Not insulting. He has a good appearance before people. He's impressive. He makes a good impression. But most of all, the Lord is with him. The Lord blesses him because he is responding to the Lord God he lives an obedient life. And this is something that would help Saul if you had this type of person in his presence. And this is what the servants are thinking about also. This tells us something about Jesse, his father, David's father. It looks like he must have been a good father. Raising David right, gave him responsibility. After all, he had to deal with eight sons. Uh, so what happens is Saul decides to get David. He doesn't know David very well. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. Now it's hard to say how old he is now, but my guess would be he's about 16. Okay. Um, later on he'll fight Goliath. Well this reminds us again that David is a shepherd. He's out caring for the sheep. Now think about it. The present king calls on David, who will be the next king. And he'll be the shepherd over God's people, Israel. So from shepherd over sheep to shepherd over people. But it'll be a while before he gets there. Now, So Jesse gets the word that the king wants his son. Verse 20. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them to David his son to Saul. So Jesse's going to send some gifts to the king along with his son. So David was now at the king's service. In other words, when the king 
wanted David, he would just call upon on him and he'd have to come. So David came to Saul and stood before him. And Saul loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. So this sums up my, what might have taken a couple of months. But he must have really liked his play and it must have really helped him. And as you have already heard, he's a warrior, a fighter, so he makes him an armor bearer. In other words, an armor bearer is going to hold the shield in front of the king and maybe carry some of his weapons while the king fights or gives commands. Okay? So David comes and stands before Saul. He's properly presented himself before Saul. And Saul was impressed. He loved him, as it says, greatly. This means he really liked him. David's skills with the instruments, his presence, the way he conducted himself, the type of man he was. He found a lot of favor with Saul. And the scripture says here, it loved him. It means he really liked him. The word love has a range of meanings from like to enjoy, that type of thing, as well as love. So he's the armor bearer, and he's to be with Saul. Saul liked him around. Verse 22. He gives out the order. Listen to this one. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. So David had just been recruited by Saul to stay with him. So what I understand this to mean, as we see later in our passage, that he's on call. If he needs to become, needs to come in and be the musical therapist, he will. He needs to go out and, and war and be the armor bearer, he will. So he's on call. Now later on we see that Saul has another armor bearer, at least one, but he probably had several. They probably switched out. So they go back and do their regular duties like David to go back home and take care of the sheep, then come work for Saul, then go back to the sheep, that type of thing. Verse 23. And whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that would be the evil spirit, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit departed from him. This probably meant that with David playing the lyre in his presence with Saul, the evil spirit would leave Saul, and this would bring relief to him. Now, now is a good point to say a few things about the Psalms. As you know, many of the Psalms were written by David. He didn't write all of them, but he wrote almost half. I think he wrote 73 out of 150. I'm going to put on the board a list. Now, you don't need to memorize this. I just want you to see it to show you the ones that he wrote. Let me look at one phrase with you. When it says in the first line, with the possible exception of 33, here's a deal. The psalm is in the collection, but it has, doesn't have his name on it. But we expect it probably him. Same with the ones in 51 through 70. 66 and 67 doesn't have his name but it probably did go to him. We're just not absolutely sure. Now, what the Psalms do, they give us what David was thinking in a number of circumstances in his life. And if you remember, if you studied any Psalms, underneath the number that they have and the title, they have like a superscription. And sometimes these superscriptions tell us the exact occasion that David was referring to. And we have several of those in our story of David. We'll be coming up on one uh, after Lesson 7, I think it is. So these Psalms give us some insight into the heart of David, how he handled grief and pressure, threats to his life and the throne, difficult circumstances of all kinds, sometimes there were times of joy and celebration. Sometimes there was sin and divine discipline and the need to confess. And many include praise, even in times of hardship. David would worship. Well, 
We'll end our lesson here, and we'll continue with our life of David next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word today. We ask that what we've heard will challenge us, and that in the power of the Spirit, we'll apply them. In Jesus' name, amen.